you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the victory that you give us, Father. Thank you for the powerful weapon of praise. Father, we just take authority right now over this place. The delegated authority that you're putting your son on the cross has given to us. We thank you for these men and the hearts that you've put in each one of them, the drawing, the calling, that you've brought them into your house tonight. We take authority over the spirit of confusion and anxiety and anger and unforgiveness and lack and judgment and shame, and we cast them, we bind them up, and we cast them out of here right now. We take authority over this place for your spirit. We thank you for coming here and and dwelling here, stirring us up and spurring us on, for whispering a a, a special, sweet, powerful word to each man in their heart tonight for what you have for them. We just pray and thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Isn't this awesome? Like, I I could go home right now. I really could. Unbelievable. Golly. They just, like, spread out, man. It's like pouring water out. (laughs) They can't say it was. Man, thank you, guys. Thank you, Ben and Juan, Kyle. You know all the guys that do this every month are volunteers? They come in, and they do the AVL, and they do the marketing, and they do the music, and they bring their own personal belongings to just make this time together uh, awesome. Uh, I'm going to grab this real quick before I get started. Um, And that being said, um, we're going to make haste. That's like an old-fashioned term, isn't it? Like always, uh, we have about seven hours of material and 35 minutes to do that in. We are in uh, under a hard uh, stop tonight because I'm traditionally really good at going too long, but we have a a teleconference this evening. Okay, okay, that's good to know. Um, We have a teleconference this evening uh, for the folks that are going on their fishing trip, and um, before I spill that, so that's going to be at the conclusion of this, and um, and so. My goal is to respect that uh, appointment. So, man, I have been gone a lot, it, and I just miss you guys. It's like so refreshing to be here. Miss you. Yeah. <laughs> so I spent two weeks in Little Rock, and uh, man, you know, you just—it's a. Uh, I'll be honest with you guys. This is probably like. One of the most contested 45-day runs of my life. I wish you could see the crap that has been going on in my house. I'm just telling you, the enemy did not want this to happen. Because what we're going to talk about tonight, I think is going to, I hope it's going to be helpful to you. I'm just telling you. Okay? All right. So uh, the t- let's do some housekeeping. Let's hit that first slide, guys. So the first slide is, um, the first slide is, Here we go. Housekeeping. March 28th, men's breakfast at Grandma's Kitchen in Winslow. Uh, These breakfasts and the dinners that we're doing, guys, are uh, very casual in nature. They um, are come and go. Hoodies and sweatpants, flip-flops and socks, whatever you do. Um, Don't wear flip-flops and socks. Please don't do that to me. Um, Please don't. Uh, But if you haven't come up to Grandma's before, it's an awesome little drive up to Winslow, and it's a super cool, like, at home feel. It's a buffet style meal. And um, so uh, that'll be at 8 a.m. That's when they open. Okay. We would do a little earlier, but that's on the 28th. Um, the calendar for all of the Beyond Church Frontline stuff is on the Frontline Men's page of the website at this point. So you can go out and if you need to ask for time off um, or if you need to, um, you know, just plan for your family time or whatever, uh, that's out there. Some of the stuff is like, hey, to be determined as far as location and uh, exact time, but you kind of know, hey, on this date, we're going to have breakfast or we're going to have a late night dinner or we're having a, a get together. Okay, so uh, this text messaging system that we use, I just wanted to take a second to kind of promote this because uh, it's helpful to, to be in the know. And we um, utilize a mass text messaging system 
uh, to send out messages. Probably some of you guys got some, a reminder this morning about this event tonight as an example. Um, this is uh, pretty much just myself and the other guy leaders of the church use it to send out messages. The way you get on that system is you text the word frontline to 33222. So if you start a new message and up at the top, you just put in the numbers like where you would put a phone number, 33222, and down in the message part where you would say, hi, mom, put the word frontline, okay? You can also put the word stop if you like. I've been on these messages for three months and I can't figure out why. Please make them go away. You can text stop to 33222. <laughs> you could do that. Okay, be on the lookout for upcoming community service events and opportunities here within the group. So the church is reaching out this year to our community. We're going to do some very focused community uh, service events with just the guys, okay? And so be on the lookout for that. Uh, go ahead and hit the next slide. The men's uh, fish fry is coming up on April 18th. Uh, I don't know that you can register today. I put that on a slide in faith, and uh, it's coming in the next couple of days, okay? We're going to have that open. I think it's going to be around somewhere between $12 and $13 a plate, but that covers your whole meal. Um, if you guys didn't make this last year, the only real, the only real kick in the shin was I think we ran out of food kind of, and that, it was good, but here's the thing. That's not going to happen this year because I figured out how y'all eat. You know what I mean? It's, it's unholy, <laughs> but I figured it out, all right? It's not to be even discussed at church what I saw, but, <laughs> but it's going to happen, all right? We're doing it again, April 18th, and here's the thing. This is a super special night, guys, because or evening, and it start, it'll start in the evening. It's on a Saturday, right? So plan to be off work. It'll be in the evening, dinner time. But this is just a great time to bring somebody that you as an individual have a connection to that no one else can pull from, right? right? Um, you know, Jesus said we're going to be fishers of men, okay? And there's somebody that you have a line to that only your love and relationship with them may be the only conduit to get them Jesus' love. And this is the time to invite them pay for their plate, um, or, uh, you know, tell them, hey, suck it up, go Dutch, right? Um, whatever happens, just bring them. There's going to be good food. I've already seen the dessert menu. Miss Jackson is already, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Okay, next slide is uh, kind of where we're going to get into this. So um, I'm going to use this slide deck, guys, to kind of guide me through this conversation because spiritual warfare is, it's, it's a deep well. And it can go a lot of different rabbit holes. You know, you chase a lot of rabbits there, okay? And my goal tonight is some transferable, actionable information, okay? Um, I like to send you guys out of here with something that you can go do that's going to make a difference in your life. That's the way Jesus intended your relationship to, to be, a difference-making relationship. It's not just show up in church, wow, that was really good. I'm going to go home and live my lame life again, right? Getting beat up by the enemy, sucking dirt, Okay. I use a lot of really awesome technical things like sucking dirt. All right. So um, that being said, uh, slide. So here we go. This is our foundation. This is why we call this talk the resistance. All right. The world, our, our communities, guys, are not full of guys that are interested in being superheroes. Okay? Most guys, um, based on the fact that... Um, they have been taught by society that the women wears the pants in their home, okay? They've been taught by society that they're going to be shamed through social media and every other form of uh, known to man. They are not interested in standing up. They're not. Anything that could bring judgment upon them, anything that could bring a negative social uh, connotation to their life, they're not interested in doing. And so Jesus says to us, if you resist the devil, he will flee, Okay, And the goal here for me is to communicate to you is that there is no one else that's going to do this. You're the, obviously, if you're a single man sitting here, you're the resistance for your own life. It, it, as it comes to the attacks of the enemy, you're, the, you're going to be the one that stands up for God's power in your life, God's ability in your life, right? And as it pertains to your marriage, if you're, if you're married and single, um, you're going to be the one that stands up for you and your wife and your, and your marriage. You're, you're the spiritual head, right? You're the resistance in that relationship as to the enemy coming into it and destroying it the way he wants to. And you can go on into the building blocks of your family and your church and your community. No one else is going to resist. I promise you. Okay? So um, every victory that you will ever um, take away in life is going to start with you standing your ground, drawing a line, saying I've had enough, okay? So, uh, slide. 
All right, so what's spiritual warfare? Super complicated. Um, I like words. Words are important because words are like framework. Words change how we see things. They change how we think about things and grab a hold of ideas. So this is just real basic, spiritual, just being relating, affecting the human spirit or soul opposed to material or physical things. So, um, and then war, right? Engagement involved in a, in a conflict. So you are in a conflict. You are in a war that is not um, physical. And, you know, I realize that that is um, so, it's hard to process. We're going to work on that a little bit. Slide. Okay, so what is spiritual warfare to you? Let's reflect on this just a minute. So you can kind of, I want you to get in the, in the thought process of what you know about spiritual warfare and what you've been trained about. Did you grow up in a church where spiritual warfare was talked about? Did you grow up in a home where it was talked about? Was it taught? Did you see people model it? Um, do you as a man at this point in your life feel like you're um, ready to meet the enemy face to face, stand your ground and utilize what Jesus has given you to actually win spiritual wars that are going on in your life? You know, where are you and where did you come from as it pertains to this subject? Because to be honest with you, it's kind of, it's one that a lot of times is just given lip service in, in the common church, right? Because it is deep and it's hard and it's, and it's hard for people to um, embrace. Go ahead and hit the next slide. But um, the foundation of this fight is just basically that we don't battle against a flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and against powers of the darkness and against spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. And I'm going to hit these scriptures really fast, guys. The slide deck will be out there. That's why it's out there. It's for you to refer back to. But one of the um, things that I want you to get a hold of is that um, there is a, a kingdom out there that, that is submissive to God but is against you. Okay? And that is what you're at war with every day. All right. So as all things with this message, um, my computer doesn't work. Everything about this message has broken everything. And that's good because I'm like, let's do this, right? All right, hit the next slide. Okay, so why are we losing? Hosea says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, okay? Um, let me put it to you like this. The enemy has been the enemy of your life a lot longer than you've been alive. They're very, very good at what they do, okay? And he knows the enemy of your life understands when you don't know, right? Uh, it's just not hard to figure out when a guy's over there tinkering with something for a little while, and he's like, he doesn't know what he's doing, okay? And the enemy is going to straight up handle you whenever that's the case. He's going to handle you, okay? Make no mistake about it. He's not playing around. He's playing for keeps. All right, so... There's a knowledge here that we need to have in order to have success in this area of our life. Uh, hit the next slide. Okay, so rules of engagement. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war, war as the world does. And so we are going to talk about things tonight that is just not going to be common among the world. A lot of you are going to sit there as I talk tonight, and you're going to go, that sounds crazy. I'm okay with that, right? Because, you know, months ago when we started Frontline, one of the founding, foundational ideas was this. We are just tired of losing, right? We're tired of being told that, you know, oh, Jesus took the keys away from the devil. Oh, we've got the victory. Oh, we got, but why is, then why is the divorce rate in the church the same as in the world? Why is the, why is the uh, adultery rate and porn rate addiction and alcohol addiction and drug addiction the same in the church? Because we don't have the victory. Because we're getting kicked in the face all the time. So we can't just simply do what everybody else does and, and, and watch what they gain from that and then think we're going to get something different, okay? And the problem that I had as a young man is I wasn't trained in spiritual warfare. You know what I mean? That kind of was like creepy to me. You know what I mean? Like spirits and ghosts and weird, like it's kind of kooky, right? I'm talking to myself. All right, next slide. Okay, so if you aren't saved today um, or if you are saved today, you got some choices, right? A lot of guys are like, I really didn't get saved to start picking a fight with the devil, right? And I get that because in, 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 in America, we free market Jesus, right? That's what we do. We, we, Jesus kind of like the Formula 409 for everything in life, in a lot of churches, from a lot of pulpits, right? It's like, man, he takes out, you know, just, just spray a little Jesus on it. It's, man, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take out your financial problems. It's going to take out your marital problems. It's going to take out all these problems. And I'm just here to tell you, um, I haven't seen that in the Bible anywhere, <clears throat> Now, Jesus has, in fact, won the victory over the enemy of our lives. And all that really did for you was position you to take advantage of that victory. But you've got to walk that out. Right? And that means scars on the knuckles. And if you look at any of the disciples' lives, 
They didn't have a Formula 409 bottle full of Jesus to spray on anything. Right? They went to fight and went to battle for everything that they won, for every life that they saved, for every demon they drove out, for every victory that they had. It was hard fought. Okay? And so, you know, if you're saved, you can like, okay, well, I really don't want to be going to blows with the devil every day. You know? So you could walk away from like the whole kind of idea. You know, you could just like play it safe. I'm going to be in neutral. I'm not going to like, I'm going to be on God's side, but I'm just not going to kick the hornet's nest. You know what I mean? Or if you're not saved, you can just stay unsaved, and then you're like really neutral, right? But the reality is that the enemy doesn't leave you alone just because you leave him alone, allegedly. He will come to find you. He's a lion, right? This is what the word says. Roaring around like a roaring lion. All right. Um, So that's a choice, but it's really not a choice because we understand that there's just death outside of God, okay? So my suggestion is we learn how to take it to the enemy and be victorious, all right? So hit the slides. So this is the equipping. All right, which one is your spiritual, your man here? Which one's your spirit man? Not your outer man. This guy here laying on the treadmill. Looks like he uh, had a, some good breakfast at Mama's Kitchen. Or the guy over here on the left, on the, my right, your le- my left, your right, putting up the weights, physically fit dude. Which one is your spirit man, right? I'm kind of more like this guy over here on the treadmill in my physical, you know, but I'm trying to become like the trained up warrior of my spirit man, okay? All right, slide. So what does the enemy look like to you? And you know, this is the crazy thing about um, society, right? Like the society gets to shape what the enemy looks like to us through all its different creative ways, right? So we've got some like real Hollywood looking stuff there in the middle, these crazy like I don't know what, de- what weirdness going on. It's really dark. Like, what does the enemy in your mind look like to you? When you visualize the, the, the enemy that you're fighting, what's the, what does it physically look like to you? And it's very important because, man, we're very visual, right? And um, we're going to take a little bit of hopefully just the creepiness out of it. Go ahead and hit the slide. So these are the three fronts that we're going to be on. The world the flesh and the devil, and these are, think of this as like a pie, right? No one of them is more um, important or less important than the other. They're just the fronts of our battle, okay? All right, slide. We're going to start with the world. Okay, so this is the front of the battle where we are dealing with culture, and we're dealing with what the enemy, what the devil and the enemy is working through culture to try and communicate to us in this earthly sense, the world, that... uh, uh, we need to get focused on the things of this earth in order to accomplish whatever it is that should be a priority to us. So this should be, any, typically this is a material thing, right? And um, the important thing to realize about this is that this is really not personal. It can be. It can become very personal. You can get very fixated on things of the world, right, as a man, as an individual. But really, this is really more like propaganda, Okay, you know, you just go all the way back to like World War II times, right? And all these leaflets would fly out of, the, out of planes and somebody would pick them up in a war zone. They'd be on one side or the other and it would have the message of the enemy on it. And it's basically trying to convince these people to believe this message. And it's this propaganda, right? We're trying to sway these people to believe and be on our side, okay? And the messaging that comes to the world, when you drive down the road and you see a billboard for uh, every kiss begins with K, Right? It's not aimed at Zolly. It doesn't say Zolly. Every kiss begins with K. It's not aimed at you, right? But it's what I call indirect fire, okay? I'm going to refer back to some, some time I had overseas. And indirect fire is basically like, um, you know, they've got these big mortar shells. And the enemy's very, in, you know, in, ingenious. They'll figure out ways to, like, get them to go off. Like, they were actually being launched out of a tank, right? But the problem is they don't have a very good aiming system. So they want to kill you with it. That'd be great, but chances are pretty low that that's going to happen because they're just lobbing this stuff wherever they can get it to go, right? It's going to blow up. It's going to, make, it's going to wreak havoc for sure, right? But it's indirect fire. So this kind of stuff is not directed at a person necessarily. It's not directed at you. But the enemy works off of observation because the enemy can't read your mind. The enemy's not everywhere all the time like God, right? But the enemy can see you react. The enemy can, can put something in your path and see how you react to it. And then based on that reaction, they're going to go to work, right? And we know that it's a little different for everybody, right? Like, I've got guys that's like, man, I've been to strip clubs. It's just not my thing. Like, it's just never done anything for me, you know? Or I've got guys that are like, man, the whole drug thing, like, I just don't get it. Like, I don't understand. Like, it's just, 
never appealed to me to try stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't understand. Like, guys get so hung up in it. It's different for everybody, right? But every kiss begins with K. There's some connotation of what? Happiness there, right? There's romance involved, right? Maybe a little sexual connotation there. <laughs> that you need to be able to buy jewelry like this if you're gonna be successful, right? These are things that are just meant to draw your focus in so that this becomes a priority to you. It's important, right? Maybe maybe you don't have the money for that, but you know, it's like, hey, this is what would make my wife happy. I mean, that wife up there, she's smiling, it would make her happy, right? So maybe I'll get this on the credit card and start some financial stress in my life and, you know, right? So this is the world. The point is this. These battles can become personal, but this is... This is the enemy's playground, and he's going to utilize it for his messaging tactics. Okay, hit the slide. So the flesh. Oh, Satan's world. Satan's world, here we are. John 5, 19, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Even Jesus was tempted with the things of the world. And we look at uh, down here in verse 8, again, the devil took, and I don't know why the actual reference for the chapter didn't come there, but that's, uh, we're going to talk about that later again, I think, at Mark. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. He said, all this I'll give to you. So this is even the, de- even, I mean, Jesus was approached with taking, taking the bait of the world, right, over God's purpose for his life. All right, slide. Okay, so we're to have none of this, right? 12, 12, Romans, don't conform to the pattern of the world. Be transformed and renewing your mind. You guys are very familiar with this. James 4, 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity or being an enemy of God, right? So you just simply know that the, world has been turned over to the devil. This is where he's operating. And our closeness or clutching of it means separation from God, right? All right, slide. The flesh. The flesh is the front of the battle between what God intended for us and what our flesh craves, okay? Now, this is kind of, again, kind of uh, individually uh, based. You know, everybody has a different kind of fleshly problem, but we all have one or the other. You know what I mean? I like Oreos. You know what I mean? And I can get carried away with that. Or Nutter Butters or Peanut M&M's, right? This is a product of the fall, our flesh being corrupt, right? And again, not personal. You deal with it. You deal with it. You deal with it. You deal with it. The goal is for the enemy to utilize one area of this or the other to make it personal, to get you into a personal battle with him that you are going to lose through these different fronts. Does that make sense? Okay. Next. So how does the enemy work through the world and really through our flesh? And that's kind of this Trojan horse concept, right? The idea is, oh, hey, if you partake in this, you know, what you've been searching for, what you've been needing, this hole that you have on the inside of you is going to be filled, right? And with that decision comes something that you didn't expect, comes a problem, comes a vice, comes a fight, comes a stress, comes something that begins to eat away at the peace, the joy, the love, what God means for your life to be, right? It's packaged. It's packaged. Does that make sense? Okay, slide. So here we see that our flesh is corrupt, right? Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, even uh, envy, uh, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you. (laughs) I warned you before. (laughs) I've told you and I've told you. Don't do these things. Romans 8, 8, for set your mind, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Right, got that scratch, got that itch, man. Just need, just need a little bit more of that, whatever that is. Right, it's a real fight. Slide, the devil. Okay, so this is personal, and um, this is direct contact. All right, this is troops in contact. All right, uh, I'm gonna have you. Uh, can you get? Can you just roll forward to that next slide? Um, 1010, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So at the end of the day, guys, to steal from you, I have to get very, very close to you. I gotta come in your house. I gotta get in your back pocket. And that can be in the back pocket of your kids, in the back pocket of your wife, in the back pocket of your personal finances. To, to kill you, 
right? This is very personal to destroy you. And um, go ahead and, and cue up that video. I want you guys to watch this uh, video. Um, and I'll just kind of, I'm going to step over here for a little bit and let you watch it. Can everybody see that okay? I just want you to be able to read these words. So, anybody ever thought those things? <laughs> How do you think I wrote them? <laughs> yeah. It's very, very, very personal. This is the battlefield of the mind, and this is where your life is won or lost, right here. Because you notice every single one of those things had the word you in it. Right? And the Bible tells us that the devil is our accuser. Right? He tells us that we're to blame. And that at the end of the day, our death and our loss is because of how flawed we are and how at the, at the apex of this conversation, Jesus is not enough. Right? Hit that slide. So we know a lie when we hear one because we have God's word to define the truth. John 8, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And guys, here is, here is where we have to begin to, to turn the ship, and we have to start to get gritty. And it comes with familiarity and the utilization of God's word. Hit that slide. One more. So let me ask you, what's the point of your relationship with God? If you are just going to lay down and take a tail whooping in every part of your life that the enemy decides to pick on you about, why are you even saved anyway? What's the point of being empowered with what Jesus did on the cross? Why did he go there and have his flesh ripped off if the best that we can do is just lay down and take it? Because he didn't come for your salvation alone. And if, if that's it, if it's just fireproof, right? Well, I got my fireproof suit. I'm good. I got saved in church when I was three. I hate to tell you this, but that's not why he came. Life and life more abundantly. Slide. Oh, watch this. Can you guys play that? So this young man is blindfolded, taking, him, taking apart an M204.
All right, so it's disassembled. Now he's going back together with it. Now that video is about two minutes long. He's, he's timing himself. <laughs> I know when I watched it, I didn't have the audio up. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, hey, possessing a weapon isn't the same as using it. Here's the thing. Uh, all these weapons have been checked and they're unloaded and uh, chamber's clear, rounds are out of them. So here's the deal. Some of you could take a piece of machinery like this and you could uh, take it out to the appropriate location, and you could um, take the magazine that goes with it, and you could put a round in that magazine, uh, a piece of ammunition, something like this here, and you could uh, uh, properly uh, slap the bolt forward, put the uh, iron sights downrange on the target, and deploy that munition uh, towards your target in an effective fashion. And some of you would pick that thing up and go, I have no idea what to do with this. Why, wow, you've never been trained. It's not that you're unwilling to learn or incapable, right? right? But here's the thing. What is the point of that capability if you don't know what to do with it? If you don't know how to employ it? Yeah. Yep. It's just a throw it at the first guy you see on the battlefield. You might get him before he shoots you. And I hate to tell you this, but as men, most of the time, this is the equivalent having no idea what to do with the weapon that Jesus gave us is where we're sitting as Christian men. We've been told it's amazing. But we don't know how to use it. And I, and I mean, I, you know, in my home, like, I'm learning. You know, my son comes to these meetings. He's like, my dad's an idiot. Like, I have seen him screw it up. And he'd be right. But I care. And we can move and we can change, we can adjust fire, right? Slide. So, sprint brass. What kind of ammunition are you using on the enemy? In our spiritual battle, this is the equivalent to God's word. The enemy is speaking it. The enemy is speaking it. The enemy is putting munitions down range at you. What are you returning fire with? Because your life, this is a spent round. There's no bullet on the end of that. This, like this right here, is a spent round. No bullet on the end of this. Should be a big old bullet on the end of this, right? But it's, this, this has been shot, okay? So your life, as it pertains to God's word, ought to be just covered in this stuff. God's word ought to be leaving your mouth towards the enemy 24 hours a day. Right? You know what tracer fire looks like? You ought to be running by your house, and it ought to look like World War III is going down. Slide. Put the spirit to the test. Let's talk about the word. Is what's talking to you, will it confess Jesus is Lord? If you say what that thing said to you, can you find it in God's word? Put it to the test, what's being said to you. Slide. So the reality is, is that we don't deal with spiritual warfare in this country the way a lot of other places do because um, we're educated, right? You come to church every Sunday. You have the word available on every device. Everything. I mean, the, God, God's word is around you all the time. You have access to it, right? And what that means is the enemy has to be more sophisticated. Can you guys see this guy sitting up here in the, in the rocks? He's sitting right up here. He's right there. See his rifle? Okay. I wish I had a laser pointer. But here's the thing. The reason why some of us are losing is just because we don't, we don't know how to identify the enemy. He's right there in front of us, but we don't know how to identify him. And you know why? It's because he's very creative in the way that he communicates to you. And that thought life that you have where he is operating 
is like that sniper. It's one little message and one little message. Before you know it, he's achieved his goal, which is to have a huge impact in your life and never be noticed. Slide. Let's turn the tide of the fight. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not flesh. We have a divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to Christ. Slide. So, your silence is consent. Your silence is consent. And here's the deal. I'll tell you a little story. Up around uh, the northern end of the uh, airfield in Afghanistan, we had this fence, and it was out there. It was just a bunch of desolate, like, desert. And it was just, like, one little road out there, and these guys would drive them down there on the little, you know, uh, motorbikes. I don't know where they were going, wherever guys on motorbikes go. And uh, there was going to be, like, these little sheep herders, and they'd be herding goats, right? Just doing Afghanistan stuff, Afghani stuff, Right? And we'd run this perimeter road, and we would get right up against the fence on the road, right? And every now and then, you'd look off in the distance, and you could, like, see some dudes. And it'd get your attention because that's not normal, right? And those dudes are like, like, what are they doing? They're too far away. Like, you can't really see. Like, you see any goats? I don't see any goats. It's just dudes. Two dudes? Two dudes. I think it's two dudes. Hmm, weird. They're just sitting out there. So you run on, right? couple days goes by and you know what you run same spot and you look out there and there those dudes are but they're closer you're like wow those dudes are like are they closer than they're closer than they were last time right huh and then three or four days walks by goes by and you go to run that run again and those dudes are right there like those dudes are there and they're just standing there you're looking around like, what are, why are they here? And then you know what? The next time you come by there, they're at the fence and they have a gun. This happened. And they're close enough to shoot you. You know what those guys are doing the whole time? They're testing the perimeter. They're testing the perimeter. How long does it take and how far can I go before I get action? Okay, and here's the deal. Your silence is permission for the enemy to operate in your presence. You know, there's times whenever I would be running down the fence, not all the time, but it happened. And, and underneath the fence, something had dug through the fence. And you're like, you don't know if that guy was leaving or coming. You're like, this is not good. Because there is an enemy in the camp, my friend. So here's the deal. When that enemy speaks to you and you say nothing, you know what you are doing? You are letting him step in. You are letting him step in a little closer. You're having that conversation because you're not saying anything. And then the next thing you know, he's in your kitchen. And you've done nothing about it. And you've communicated that you don't know what to do or you are gutless. That's what you've said to the enemy of your life. I don't even know what to do right now because I, I'm, I'm watching you come in. I'm listening to you tell me what God has not said about me and I'm not going to respond. So, are you ignorant? Because it, it, the root word of ignorant is ignore. Why are you ignoring it? Why are we ignoring it? Are you ignorant? Do you not know what his purposes are in your life? We do know. We're not ignorant. Slide. Spoken authority. Let's go through this real quick. This is the tempter. He came, and in yellow, this is what you see happen. Je Jesus is being confronted with the enemy. And, and, and I, don't even, I won't even read this, but this is what I wanted to tell you. Up here, he says, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And he says, it is written and responds. But look at what happens in the next transaction. The enemy responds, and you know what he says? It is written. The enemy says, it is written. He knows the word of God. He knows what's written. He's not wondering what God has to say about this matter. He knows 
And the rebuttal that Jesus gives him is this. Oh, yeah, you're right. It is written, but it is also written, and that's wisdom. And the only way you get that is communion with the Holy Spirit. Time. Time in the seat. Time familiarizing yourself with the weapon. Taking it apart. Putting it together. Taking it apart. Putting it together. Slide. So we see eventually what happens is Jesus says, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And I'm just here to tell you, if that's the only thing you walk out of here with tonight is the ability to say, away from me, Satan, for the word of God says to worship him only, you know he has to obey that. Slide. Shooting blanks. So here's, here's a Christian problem, right? I love cr- Christian cliches. Make me nauseous. Things that, you know, people get used to saying at church, and it's just a church thing, so we say it. I think that's what Christian people say, so I'm going to say it. You know, praise the Lord, we have the victory. That's true. That's true, right? But if I'm on a battlefield and dude is, like, dumping fire at me, I can't say, we have the victory. He's dumping fire at me. He's putting bullets in my face. He doesn't care what I'm saying. This, this generic statement, I have to put some rounds back his way. Specifically. And the way that I do that is I use God's word with precision. And you know, one of the things that we have here at this church, because we have one of the most incredible pastoral leadership staff here. I've been in a lot of places, guys. You know, out every day out there, every Wednesday, Sunday, and the days you don't come here, there's a packet out there, and it's got all kinds of scriptures in it about healing and about victory over certain particular areas. And you know what? If you're like, man, you know what I really struggle with? Cussing at people on the highway. Google it. Google what does God say about cussing at people on the highway. It'll bring up scripture. What does is, what is Google say about staring at the lady in the yoga pants? It'll bring up scripture. Whatever your problem is, there is a God's word for it. And it's not just some generic random thing that you heard at church one time. Your your pastor can't do it for you. He doesn't study to show you approved. So stop living off the generic Christianity that you were that you grew up in with Sunday school, which is wonderful. You need to know the Bible stories. But you're not boys anymore. You're men. That's right. You can't resist living like a little boy. It's time to go past that. Yes, Slide. Yes, sir. Prisoners of war. And this is why. You ever met a Christian that's just like living like a prisoner in the war he allegedly won? Look at these guys. Just marching it out, man. Oh, God, I hope it don't hurt bad this time. Anorexic, unfed, unnourished by what God meant to bring to you, but you've let it be stolen. You've, had, you, you've let the enemy come in and come in and come in and you don't respond. This is not how we were meant to live. Slide. Take every thought captive. We demolish the arguments of every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought. Slide. So here's the deal. This is a military ECP intricate toll point. You'll notice in green and yellow and red, the different force effects that take hand. This is evaluation, handle light signals, flares, warning shots and signals, lethal force. Once you come through here as the green target, as the green area of traffic, and you do not obey this ECP, lethal force is authorized. This is how you take a thought captive. You have an entry control point for your heart, things you will not accept. Thoughts come at you, you did it again. Idiot, why would you? You know this is your fault. All those thoughts, you know what you got to do? You set them up. Okay, okay, I hear what you're saying. Guess what? Here's what we're going to do. We got to check the payload, okay? You run a military uh, ECP, what you do is you bring vehicles in. And what happens is these guys with dogs and mirrors, they walk around these vehicles. And you know what they're looking for? A payload. Where's the bomb? Where's the, the thing that's going to cause death 
and, and dismemberment. And what's going to happen when that thing goes off is everybody is going to feel the effect of this payload. So what's the payload of the enemy's thought in your life? What's the intended damage? Because it's not just words that he's saying to you. The point of those words is to get something inside of you that causes the destruction. It's got a payload. And we have to examine that. And the way we do it is we use God's word. God's word is our mirror and our dog. Nope. This one don't pass, chief. This one, this thought doesn't get, this, this one doesn't come in the gate. Slide. A non-biblical version of Christianity. Here's the deal. I hate to tell you this, guys, but if it's not in the Bible, it's just not true. And here's the problem. A lot of Christian men want to just live a non-biblical Christianity where there aren't consequences for your choices, where healing's not real, where the gifts of God aren't real, where, you know, all the things that are in that book, your financial obligations, your commitment level to the gift that God gave you, living a non-biblical version of Christianity is just positioning yourself on the enemy's side. Because if you're not for me. So you can go home tonight and we can go home tonight. I can go home tonight and I can say, well, I'm sure that God would just, you know, and I, and I can just make up my own, little, my own little world. It just doesn't work that way. The enemy's goal is to delete what's in that word. Delete it. Slide. Holding ground. In the spiritual realm, when we knowingly allow sin to remain in our lives, we are giving ground to the enemy. This is where you need to take notes. Because here's the deal. It's one thing to sin, right? It's one thing to sin. It's another thing to take that sin, put it right here, and now it's just my little secret. You know what you've done? You see those red lines and the blue lines? You said, look, you can have a little tent over here, right? Enemy, you can have a little tent over here. And I'm only going to, you know, like when nobody else is around, I can turn the computer on. When nobody else is around and I can kind of do, you know. And guys, when you grab a hold of that sin and you allow it to be your little secret in your life, you are letting the enemy hold ground in your life. You're turning over a portion of the ground that God meant to give you in your life and you're giving it to them and you cannot coexist. Slide. Sin gets a handhold. So when we compartmentalize, compartmentalize these areas of our life and we don't make them available to God, what happens is that the devil's like gets a chink in the armor, right? And he's able to get a handhold. It's not a big handhold, but this is how it starts. Very small. Slide. Todd, if you don't mind, if you come up here, sir. And I just, I, I wanted Todd to share this testimony. He offered to do it, which was amazing. I don't know what to do with this, guys. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Hold it. Hold it. Thank you. I had it. And uh, just to kind of set up what Todd's going to talk about is um, his personal experience just with kind of confronting um, some spiritual power. And it's going to kind of lead into the next section of what we're talking about. Um, and I want you to reflect as Todd tells a story on some things in your life maybe you've experienced. We're way over time. I'm really sorry. I'll just do this real quick. So, like, I like practical, practical application. I don't want to go somewhere and just listen to a good story. I'm just getting to the age where I, just, I ain't got time for that anymore. <laughs> I want to go somewhere where I'm trained to go out and do whatever I need to go out and do. Um, but this happened at the last church I was at. My pastor um, had always told us, you know, people call him and he goes over and, and, and uh, does spiritual warfare at people's houses or wherever, you know. And so, I, you know, just jokingly, you know, because I was like, yeah, right, you know. Um, so I said, can I go with you sometime? And he said, yeah. So about six months later, he gave me a call and he said, um, I'm going tonight. You need to pray up. And, you know, I'm thinking, pray up, what are you? You know, because really, we're not trained. We're not trained to go do that. That's right. Or, you know, I mean, maybe I'm on the wrong wagon. I, I just wasn't trained to do that, okay? 
So I said, okay, he told me what to do. I prayed up. He came by and picked me up, and we, he goes, we're going over to this lady's house. It goes to our church, and she says, I can't sleep at night. My feet feel like they're on fire. And um, I, this has been going on for like six months or so, and I, and I just can't get rid of this. And, I, and I'm, so Larry just asked me to go with him, and I, we went over there, and he goes, I tell him we go over there, I have to ask the, uh, the husband if it's okay to do that because you've got to get permission from the head of the house to go do that. So we did. He said, fine. We start walking down the hallway, you know, and I'm like still like, you know, just be bopping through there, you know. Just We got down this hallway, and it got thick. I mean, you could physically feel presence that I've never felt before. And we got, it was just like a little three-bedroom house. And so there's a, down a hallway, a bathroom, three bedrooms. Hers was the last one on the left. So we go down there, and we're, and we're, and I'm, Go to her bedroom, he opens the door, and I'm telling you, you couldn't stick your head in the door. I've never felt anything like that. I've never experienced, since that day, I've never experienced something like that. But you couldn't go in, and all he said was, in Jesus' name, Spirit, I bind you up, and you have to leave now. And it was like you could fall in. It was like somebody flipped a light switch, and he said, Todd... You go to that bedroom, you do the same thing, I'm going to do this bedroom, and we're done. And I went to that bedroom thinking, what in the world? You know what I mean? I've, what did I experience? Can I do this? I opened the door, the, the hair on the back of my neck just stood up. It was like the craziest thing I've ever felt. I opened the door, I said those words, and it was just like I could walk in the room. It was just like a normal room. So if you take something out tonight... You have this power inside. If I can do it, I'm just an electrician. If I can do it, you can do it. And you, if, you know, it may be your kids or your grandkids. You walk in that room and you don't feel comfortable. Does you feel pressure? You have control over that authority. You take authority in Jesus' name. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Todd. Now, let me tell you why. Let me, let's hit that next slide, guys. Let me tell you why I specifically asked Todd to tell that story. It's because when you got saved, Jesus took ownership of your house, okay? Your life being the house, right? But you stay the individual that's responsible for tending that house. And you know, your house has rooms, right? Just like your physical house. And can you rent a room out to somebody? Yeah. And what happens when you get a dirt bag that comes lives in that house, Right? And he's in there smoking tamales, <laughs> right? Cooking noodles. He's going to ruin the rest of your house? Slowly but surely, right? And so here's the deal. The owner of your life hasn't changed, but your life has. Your quality of life has. And this is the compartmentalization of sin. And, the, and one of the things that Todd told me as he was telling the story last night was that... Um, what ushered into that, what brought this spirit into this individual's house was what this guy was watching on TV. He had got locked into watching this, and, it, he, and this happened from the time that he began watching these television programs, and they didn't really correlate what had happened, the invasion that had taken place. And so I, we're not spending a lot of time on demonic issues tonight. We can talk about that if you want or need to at when we're done. Um, but the bottom line is, guys, is that you cannot kitty hole the enemy over here and think that you're going to live this compartmentalized life. Yeah. Slide. All right, confession. So we must evaluate our lives through the lens of God's word and be honest. Now, the reason I put this picture up here is because this guy's in a suit and his face has been beat off. Right? And isn't that how we live? Like, we try to look good on the outside and we have just been whipped behind doors, right? Confession is our relinquishment. It's our repentance to God, okay? It's like prayer in the word, all right? This is where we find God's will. It's the conduit through which the Holy Spirit reveals his plans for us. Prayer is the way in which we counsel with God about the above and the counterattacks that we need to be taken on the enemy, Prayer in the word. Slide. All right, there's no buzzer. 
There's no buzzer. See, what Jesus did was eternal, right? But your fight is today. Your fight is today. It's not like a basketball game where it's like, man, all right, here we go, guys. Let's go, team. Get, man, let's get prayed up. Here we go. And we, we go. We, we sweat. Whew. We won. The buzzer rings, and we're done. No, tomorrow you're going to wake up and get kicked directly in the tail again. What Jesus did was eternal, but your fight is daily, and it will be until your breath stops coming out of your body. Because until then, the enemy knows game is not over. He can still still kill and destroy from you, and that's his objective. So what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to think, oh, well, Jesus did it all. Well, Jesus positioned you to be able to win your fight against the enemy that you still face today through his eternal victory. But you got to understand that the, the life more abundantly is a lot more, has, to, has a lot more to do with what you need to do today than what he did back then. He engaged. He gave it all. He stepped up. He, he went the mile. Now you got to follow in his footsteps. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Slide. Recap. Use the entry control point for your mind. Use God's word to test the payload of your thoughts. Use your delegated authority to resist and push the enemy back. Spend time in prayer in the word. And I'm going to close. Get honest and open about your sin and, hold, and what you've been holding on to and confess that. Here's the process and then I'm done. The way you take authority in your life is this. When you hear that come at you, when you hear that word come at you from the enemy, you say, no, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I don't accept that. Spirit of fear, spirit I, spirit of depression, you, I take authority right now. You flee from my presence. Right. See, you don't have, I don't say in the power of Landon. Landon's an awesome guy. I don't say by the power of Jake, Ben. No, in Jesus' name, not in Joe's name. You don't have any authority when it comes to the enemy. Zero. You have delegated authority and you can use it all day long. Remember, remember when the disciples were over there fighting about this guy that was using Jesus' name to cast out spirits and he wasn't a part of them? That's how powerful his name is. You don't even have to be with this guy and you can use his name to control the enemy. He's like, hey, we're still winning, guys, right? So you open your mouth and you push the enemy back off the fence, back off the fence. The next thing is, is you get honest with yourself and with God about where you've taken that sin and you've made it your little secret and you've put it in your pocket and you've allowed the enemy to hold ground in your camp. You confess that sin and you ask God to simply cancel the ground that the enemy has held in your life. Say, this is yours now. I confess it. Slide. Alex, will you pass that around? So I want you to put this in your pocket. I want you to go home and find a Sharpie. I want you to, don't put anything on it. You can write on it. You remember how they used to put names on bombs and stuff. But this is a bullet that's got a name on it. And I don't know where you need to start tonight, but you do. That one enemy, this bullet is for them. If for some legal reason you're not supposed to have ammunition in your house, <laughs> don't take a bullet. <laughs> and tell them that Joe was handing out But you put that in your pocket. And when you get that thought in your mind about you and your wife, you get your thought, that thought in your mind about what you used to be and who you used to, what, you used to, what you've done before and why you're not worthy, you reach in and you pull that thing out. And you don't have to show it to anybody, but you just hold it. And you raise up that hand with that bullet in and you say, in Jesus' name, no more. You let it be your constant reminder of the weaponry that you have at your hands. Let it be your constant reminder that you need to study that weapon, that you need to become wise in how to use it. And that the victory that it was meant to be brought into your life through it. Those are reloads, by the way. <laughs> I mean, Joe gave me the crappiest bullet I've ever seen in my life. Slide. All right, that's it. Guys, we're over time. I'm sorry. 
Um, I just want to pray for you before you leave. Um, something that was passed to me a couple weeks ago was that um, just kind of a word for this body is that, you know, letting shame rule your life and be the reason why you don't step into what God has for you or respond to God's call in your life is pride. It's the belief that what sin you've faced in your life and what impact the enemy has had in your life up to this point is gonna make you unworthy of relationship with God or unworthy of relationship with his people, and that's just a lie. And so... Um, You know, there's, the intent of this meeting is to always be more than just being talked to. Like, I don't, you guys don't need to be talked to anymore. The intent is to empower you to go live the victory that God meant for you. And um, so, that being said, Father, we just thank you for tonight. We thank you again for these men. And we just ask that the seed that was planted tonight would grow. And I just bind up and I take authority right now in Jesus' name over any spirit and weapon that would be formed against these men, and I cast them away. We, we resist them in Jesus' name. They have no authority. And I ask you, Father, to reveal for these men where they've been deceived, where they've been duped by the camouflage and the counterfeiting of the enemy. Reveal to their hearts, Father. Bring them your divine wisdom. Give them courage. Give them bravery. Give them the willingness to stand up and say no more. My life and the life more abundantly that Jesus meant for me, I claim it right now. Help them see the enemy coming and to remember to take those thoughts captive and give them a word to counter every attack of the enemy. Bring it to the recalling of their heart and their mind. Thank you for your son that made us worthy in the relationship that you maintain with us every day. We just ask and thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.